Hi guys, welcome to my shop. I'm Robin. Uh, today I've got a fun uh, project and that is making uh, two different custom calipers for a customer. And uh, I'll be showing it in three parts. And uh, the first part is going to be uh, design, disassembly, uh, chopping up the calipers, and uh, making some uh, carbide pins, cutting them off. And then the second video will get into uh, finishing the pins, radiusing them, putting spherical ends on, making the attachments that get silver soldered on, and uh, silver soldering them. And um, then we'll also do all the final grinding in the third video, uh, where we um, cut the uh, grooves for the pins to pinch, uh, the grabs the gauge pins that, that are the jaws, uh, lots of surface grinding setups for all the different angles and things. So it uh, should be uh, pretty interesting. A uh, big thank you to all the new subscribers that have uh, subscribed to my channel. Uh, very, very much appreciate that. I'm um, glad you uh, are enjoying some of this content. Hope to produce a lot more. And uh, I think we should just dive in. Customer ordered um, one face caliper. It has pins for measuring face, facial grooves, like labyrinth grooves and one uh, caliper that is for ID groups. So um, since I'm making them, I might as well make a set of each for myself. So that's why we're doing two of each. So this is what the customer sent me, uh, a little sketch of a caliper with pins right here that stick out a hundred thousandths. And they've got 062 diameter here just as a, as a suggestion. So in the grand scheme of things, I realized that in order for this to work out well, since they want to measure both inside and outside, if I make this pin 50 thousandths, then it adds exactly 0.1 to the uh, closed jaw measurement, or the uh, inside measurement, and therefore I can just, uh, you can just mentally take the 0.1 away. So we're going to use a 50 thousandths carbide pin. Then this caliper is for uh, basically a snap ring groove style of, of measurement. Uh, you can see they need a reasonably deep depth and um, they're looking for a 70 thousandths minimum uh, or max um, width here and they're showing a actual like a, a flat web jaw. The problem with those is that um, they're easy to break because as you put it in the groove if the, if the operator moves the caliper sideways and crams that that uh, that blade style jaw in the groove you can easily snap it off. So I'm making a design decision here to use a 16th diameter carbide and I'm going to just put a spherical end on the each of these carbide pins and that spherical end will be a radius that's smaller than the smallest diameter that they're after and um, they um, they need at least an 80 thousandths depth and um, they want to get into, let's say, a one inch uh, diameter bore minimum. This is the face groove caliper. Uh, we've ground off the nose of the, of the jaw, original jaws. We've ground a groove in the caliper jaws to receive the tongue on the custom piece that we're adding on. It'll be silver soldered onto the, uh, onto the jaws. Uh, carbide, 50 thousandths carbide pins grabbed by a 080 Torx head screw. And um, this is the original Mitutoyo frame that I've modeled and then just modified these. So these match the original tapers. And these uh, cylindrical pins actually are stick out about uh, a thousandth of an inch from this face so that when you close the caliper they actually uh, touch each other so that you can zero them. This is the ID groove calipers. Same situation but a little bit different modification to the jaws. The original jaws have been shortened uh, further back, and the added jaws are obviously much longer. These get the 60 thousandths, uh, actually 16th diameter pins, and a 0.4 spherical radius on the end here so that they will uh, work inside a, a one inch ID uh, as far as that goes. The extra um, thickness at the bottom here is strictly to get enough. Uh, thread length of engagement on the 080 screw so that they've got a, a good good bearing area and these uh, pins can actually be set to whatever stick out is necessary uh, in this case we're going to set them at 0.1 inch 
Um, and uh, these will be silver soldered, uh, same as the other ones. And uh, we'll see that in the rest of the video. Go. So these calipers come apart pretty easy. Uh, as soon as you take the back cover off. There's our battery cover. Telling you how to start it up. Yep, thing of beauty. So, back cover. Get a razor blade underneath this. And just gently peel this up. Not really worried about saving that to put it back on, but um, they've actually improved these. These are a lot more durable than the old ones. So I probably will put this back on when we're done. Um, then it's just a matter of taking the thumb rule bracket off. And four screws. Four and there it is. Now you got your bare frame. There's the electronics inside. Okay, I've got a, like a, about a 40 thousandths cutoff wheel in there with um, aluminum um, reinforcing discs on both sides. I'm bringing this up to my vise right here and saying, okay, there's my stop point. I don't want to run into my vise by accident. So I'm putting my table stop down there so I can comfortably come in and know, okay, I'm not going to run into that. Now, I've got to remember if I change my height, I will be able to run into that. Here we're cutting off the original ID uh, jaws of the calipers since these are dedicated calipers those would just be uh, in the way. Here we're cutting off the uh, jaws for the ID groove calipers where the jaws are cut off closer to the beam and are thicker in the back. Uh, this is the other calipers with that are going to be the face group calipers where I'm just cutting off just that relieved tip area. Now we're uh, just dusting off the back where we remove the ID jaws just to get a, a nice finish across those. Here I'm squaring the end of the calipers up it's true to the beam. This is the face groove caliper and then this is the ID groove caliper. Now we have a nice true surface cleaned up on the back so it looks professional back there and then on the uh, front jaw surface that will provide a good uh, straight area for the uh, other pieces to mate to. Now we have the 40,000 uh, part off disc and we're now getting to, ready to groove this to leave the groove for the uh, tongue on the mating piece and uh, take a pass through there uh, 50 thousandths deep at a time and we're creep feeding through there to um, actually cut the groove. So 100 thousandths deep, two 50 thousandths passes. There's the groove finished. And um, so those will meet up with the pieces. We'll mill the tongue to match that. Same thing on the other caliper. This is the face groove caliper, or the previous was the ID groove caliper. 50 thousandths was the first pass. Now that's 100 thousandths, our full depth. As I mentioned before, I'm making the gauge pins for the face groove caliper 50 thousandths so that the two of them, when you're measuring on the other side, equal exactly 0.1, allowing the uh, measurement to just be a mental addition of a 0.1 to it. Obviously, we're talking inches um, in this case. Problem is, there's no readily available 50 thousandths carbide gauge pins uh, that I could find. And the closest carbide drill blank that I can find is uh, a number 55 um, drill blank, which is 52 thousandths. So um, the finish on this isn't really all that great. It's not, it's not gauge quality, not to mention the fact that we have to get down to 50 uh, thousandths. So I'm making some laps to uh, allow me to lap this down to 50. So I'm going to use 15 micron to get down to, um, I think, I'm going to use 15 micron to get down, remove the material quickly. Then I'll use 3 micron for the finish. And with laps, uh, you never want to try to combine in the same lap uh, two different um, 
grid sizes because the larger grid size is always going to leave some trace it's going to leave you scratches so I have um, the style of lap that I'm going to do here is where um, I have these cast iron gray cast iron pieces and they're squared up and and flat and I will put these together like this in a um, toolmaker's clamp and I use the toolmaker's clamp for my actual uh, lapping pressure so I am going to put this in the mill I'm going to edge find and get right on the center line right down the crack drill and then ream with this 50 thousandths reamer which I'll be using for the other pieces I'll ream through and I'll do several holes in a row I'll do probably three or four holes in a row with a little gap between them and that will give me my ream I'll probably put a um, 1 16th ream tool right back here to keep these in line using a 16th dowel pin in the back uh, when I'm done obviously there's no there's no adjustability with this the way I have it now until I take this apart and open these up like this and surface grind this area from here out taking maybe five or ten thousandths off probably, well probably only about five thousandths off I leave the ten thousandths gap from here out leaving this bearing band here still there so that it will bear and keep them parallel in the other direction and the 1 16th dowel will keep them aligned as far as skew this way okay now the part itself can do that alignment but having the pin in there the 16th pin will make life easier than trying to use the, the pin the uh, part to align it so I'm going to do a set of these um, for the 3 micron and then I'll do a set of these for the 15 micron. You can see I have a marked and I have a diagonal there to know which way when these come apart and I would deburr them that I know that this is the way they were machined and I don't uh, reverse anything. Here I'm measuring the thickness of the whole group, dividing it by two, and that's how far I'll move over to Edge Finder to get right on the center line crack. Spotting all the holes, that was the 16th hole in the end, and then the 50,000 uh, holes drilling for the 50 thousandths ream, the pre, pre ream drills, drilling the pre ream for the 1 16th holes on each of the two. I'm just using the uh, hand wheels on the on the table for the measurements here. Now I'm reaming the 16th holes on each of them. That's our pivot pin that's going to hold us parallel. 50 thousandths carbide left hand reamer, reaming all of the holes one one would probably do the whole job, but figured extras are easy while it's while it's in there. There they are. Take them out of the vise. Wait for the camera to focus. There we have them. There they are. There's all of our half circle grooves ready to go. Surface grind. Just take a little bit off the whole surface, and then we're coloring it on the back with blue sharpie and then we're going to take five thousandths off all but the little strip in the back where the sixteenth pin is you'll see the blue will still be left on in the back as it come out of the chuck there that's the stripe where the sixteenth pin is using uh, very small needle files to lay in there to deeper the edges of the holes and the, the ends now we take our dowel pin set it in place in the uh, rear 16th ream that we did that gives us our alignment put our parallel clamp on and then we actually tighten the parallel clamp here firmly to hold this back corner now we have actual adjustment with just our tail screw for setting our size for getting our our uh, our pin in so now we can just adjust as we lap we can adjust our pressure on this and as we wear out a hole if we do we we'll probably won't wear out any of it one hole would probably work but while we're doing it it pays to put more in there so I'm using a 364 collet here uh, which is 0469 and the pin is currently 052 just a word of warning when you've got something uh, as hard as this a uh, carbide pin and the collet. Uh, when it comes to a, a contest of deformation, the collet's going to lose in this case. So you've got to be very, very careful, especially when the part is oversized, uh, more undersized, when it's not a match with the collet size. 
um, if you're not real gentle with your collet pressure, you can easily uh, deform the collet surface. So just a word of warning when you're doing something like this. There, we're fitting our uh, lap on. Just getting our initial feel here. Yeah. Okay, I don't have any slurry in there yet. Okay, and then we have our 15 micron slurry. I'm just going to pass down through the slot here. And uh, turn this on. And this gentle pressure here. You gotta be careful not to put any heavy side loads on this since this is carbide. This is is not uh, can easily be snapped off, so can't go leaning on this thing. So all that black you see is carbide particles coming off. And that little gap forms a nice uh, feed for the slurry to feed in there. Okay, slide right off the end. You gotta be very, very careful on cleaning. When you're lapping with diamonds, any diamond residue left on your part and you go miking it with your carbide uh, faced or any faced uh, micrometer, um, you're going to end up scratching your faces up real quick. So that took uh, about four tenths off of there that quickly. So this isn't going to take long. But before I get carried away, I'm going to switch end for end and work this side down. You can kind of tell by drag where you're where you're actually working. A little, still a little tighter at the end here where we wasn't lapped, so you, you have to pay attention and focus on where you're feeling your your drag and when something this small, very subtle differences. Yep, we're four tenths everywhere, so now I'll just go a little little more on this. Get down to we're closer. We'll get better mics out when we're when we're actually closer to the uh, at the end here. A little more slurry. Just a little more pressure. This is cutting really quick. Okay, just making sure we're not traveling too quick. So now I'm down to just about uh, four tenths over. Uh, so I'm switching to my three micron. Uh, Got to give time for the lap to kind of wear in a little bit. So you want some room. I might regret leaving that much with three micron, but 
uh, and you also have to make sure you leave enough uh, space to um, take down the, the finish from the 15 down to what you get with a 3 sometimes can take a fair amount of material also uh, to get all the scratches out so um, we're going to lap now with the 3 micron I don't have any actual slurry so I pre-charged the, the uh, lap with some paste you can see sitting down here I have a little cup and my brush and um, This finish will be much, much shinier. This will look more like a gauge pin now. Same thing here, we don't want to assume that this is cutting super slow and end up uh, like wondering why we're undersized. That would be tragic right now. So go to slow speed and just come off the end. Actually, I'm just going to release the pressure on this to come off. And that looks a lot better. I can see, I don't know how well you can see on that, but I can see the uh, scratches still from the 15 micron. So with 3 micron, cast iron is uh, about uh, starting to reach its limit for being able to leave a nice finish without scratches. Uh, typically use a softer lap uh, at 3 micron to get a, a nice finish. Um, I mean, this is more than functional, but it doesn't have a real gauge finish on it. So I'm taking a piece of 3 thousandths aluminum foil and uh, wrapped it around the part, and then I'm going to put that in the lap. And basically I'm lining the lap with uh, aluminum to, and it's going to give me the same conforming, conforming uh, situation there. So. Now that I've got that in there, I'll get my clamp on it, and we will do the same uh, same thing. But now we're going to be having a softer, much softer uh, conforming material, which is aluminum, which does a nice job lapping. And if I can get my toolmaker's clamp to cooperate, I think I will. I just have to keep the pin tight here in the back, but still be able to be able to. Uh, have that so now we'll go ahead and put that in and we'll lap with the uh, aluminum foil on the on there so I'm just going to spread open the aluminum foil here so that the uh, slurry can get down into the crack there to feed this so now I'm just going to put a layer of that down there and that'll wick down in and, and get a good hold on there now tighten up the now the aluminum is going to conform to that and start to start to cut this you can see the black haze starting to form there and I'm not going to uh, remove this. I'm going to flip this end for end. Just take a check and see where we are here. Just because it's aluminum doesn't mean it won't cut quickly. I can already see a radical difference in the finish. And we still have two tenths on there so we got we got room to play here. So I keep it even, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shut this off, wipe this end off and flip it in the collet without taking it off.
see the torque on the on the lap there. It's actually raising it up and Taking another measure check here. Yeah, still two tenths. Another important tip here is uh, as I'm moving this and I'm flipping this end for end with the slurry still on here even though I clean it off, if I let this get over and touch where the, the slurry wicks into the collet, you've got to immediately stop. Take the collet out, ultrasonic clean it, get all the grit out of there because once that embeds in that collet it's going to scratch this. Uh, and not to mention the fact that it could migrate out through the slots from the centrifugal force and get in between your collet interface and start chewing your collet seat. So um, I just had that happen. I just realized I had it come up and touch. So out with the collet over the ultrasonic and clean it and put it back to, back in again. So now I'm going to take a piece of paper with some three on here. And you might think that paper's not going to do anything, is it? Well, I'm rubbing this dry now. Nothing's on the paper. And you can see there's no residue left on the paper where it was rubbing. Now I'm going to put a little three micron slurry there and now I'm going to Now let's see what the paper looks like. See the black? That's uh, evidence that it's obviously taking off material. And uh, as slow as the aluminum removed the uh, material, I'm not concerned. Actually, I'm going to double this over. I'm not concerned that I'm I'm on the, I'm 50 millionths high on this, which is where I wanted to quit. So I'm just going to I'm just polishing this for effect. Hard not get carried away and let's we'll see how nice the finish you can get on stuff like this. Okay. There it is. And it's got a pretty stinking nice finish on it. And we are, should be around uh, well, let's check it actually. We've got our two pins. We have our 50 thousandths pin that we just got done lapping, and we have our um, 16th diameter uh, pin. The 50 thousandths pin um, is for the face groove caliper, and this one is for the ID groove caliper. So these have to be cut into sections. The, the small one gets cut into uh, quarter inch long pieces, and this gets cut into like 455 or something long pieces. So how do I cut these? Um, and leave a nice square edge on both ends and not end up um, disturbing their surface from junk in the jaws or whatever in the vise and I have to cut them off at a controlled length. So here is uh, a quick and dirty fixture for doing that. Just a piece of aluminum that I can grab in the um, grinding vise. A uh, bandsaw to cut in it first off just down the middle to give me a uh, ability to have a flexure here and then I just took the a, a 364th Woodruff cutter 
touched this bottom surface and cleaned it up so that it had a, a milled surface and then he came up and touched this bottom surface and went in about 35 thousandths enough to cover both half the diameter of the 16th pin and obviously smaller than the 50 thousandths pin so that gives me a ledge to rest on and edge and then this can actually clamp and grip them and then to control the distance I made I touched here with the same Woodruff cutter set it at the cutter width uh, when I touched on here then moved down a quarter of an inch so that this actual overall distance is a quarter that way I'll be able to put the quarter inch ones in just put them flush clamp them cut through and lather rinse repeat um, and then the longer one all I have to do is use my uh, calipers with the depth rod set to the difference between 250 and its length slide them out clamp them do the same thing now in order to touch when I come in here I'll take my diamond wheel and my diamond cutoff wheel and I'll just come in here and I'll just go till I just hear it touching this surface just scuffing on here and that'll be close enough for what we're doing these lengths aren't critical on these uh, it's just that they need to be clean and if I just have it stick it out of the vise on the parallel and whack it off, well, you end up with an incomplete cut on the one piece. You end up with a lip, whereas the the wheel typically wears with a uh, radius kind of on the end, cuts through in the center, and then leaves this edge on there that you have to go dress. Well, I don't want to have to be fooling around trying to grab the quarter inch long, fifty thousandths pin and re-squaring it on a diamond wheel again. So, putting a little extra effort in this cutoff fixture. Uh, for the uh, squareness that's necessary on the ends of these is uh, is worthwhile and this top I'll just grab with a uh, vice grip um, little uh, vice grip C-clamp type thing to do my clamping pressure and here I've got the, uh, the fixture block in the in the grinding vise and I just came over until I'm just dragging my high spot is the high spot on the wheel I swung that around until that's just touching so now I know I'm just touching the edge of that so that lets me know that I should get a roughly quarter inch piece when I stick it out there flush